as you can see in the background here, we have the brick church identified and the lock church. In front of the brick church is what is called the Stranger's Graveyard. The Stranger's Graveyard was built because uh, we are persons who are considered strangers, non Moravians, people who were from a different area that worked in, works in Salem at that time. Those who escaped the conditions that they had, they had soldiers that were hiding out, if you want to say, in the German speaking town of Salem. In the front of the graveyard, um, it started in the 1775s, I think it is, and ended up in 1959. Anybody who was not a and a Moravian, a Christian Moravian, and died, was buried in the strangest graveyard. Those who of slaves are black persons who were, um, who were Christian and joined the Moravian church were buried in one section. Moravian is, is a great set of many sections. There's the original slave graves, uh, strangest graveyard. There's a, a side that you have. I was, I don't see good Christian Moravians and their kids on the other side, down in another section of the area. There were Moravians that were not truly Christian, those that smoke and those that dance and those that curse and that type of thing. They were in another section of the area. So the stranger's graveyard is only one part of it. The stranger's graveyard also was under the front part of the church, the brick church, which was expanded uh, to accommodate the Sunday school. The Sunday school itself was a training school rather than just Sunday school. More people attended the church, more people attended the Sunday school that were than on church. And in the Sunday school, in that training period, the slaves were alert, were taught the trades that they practiced during the day. They also spoke German and were, were like in, interpreters to talk to the, the German Germans in the area. The slaves could translate to other people. The Sunday school expanded in the 30s. And in that period, the law was passed to prevent them from being taught, the slaves from being taught English because of the rumors going around of insurrections. They also had the problem in Haiti and that to prevent slaves becoming active, the law was passed to prevent them from speaking, from learning English. The brick church itself was built in 61. The, the log church was built in 1822. Actually, in 1823, the structure was put up. In 18, um, structure was put up and lasted until 59. Then the brick church was built because the log church itself could hold the attendance of the people that were willing to attend that service, the services in the brick church. The brick church itself lasted for a long time, but then it deteriorated and was actually closed for a period of time. During that time, the church itself moved to Happy Hills, and uh, the historic Dennis will come up and talk about that. Happy Hill period, which was uh, about a mile or so in the distance of the back of the steps. stopped at the uh, brick church uh, when it started deteriorating and filling up. In 1946, Brother George A. Hall was appointed lay pastor of St. Philip's. Brother Hall, Dr. Hall was um, 
professor at Winston-Salem State. He came from Nicaragua. His father started a Moravian mission there. So he was very familiar with the uh, Moravian church. So the uh, PEC reached out to him and he became the lay minister there at St. Philip's in 1946. In 1952, the spring of 1952, the last service was held at the Greek, the Greek church, we call it the Old Church. And the St. Philip's congregation moved to a community center in Newley, okay, in Happy Hill. I don't have a picture of the Happy Hill Community Center. At that time, Happy Hill Gardens was new and a new uh, housing project for African Americans. So I think that the congregation saw an opportunity to be there and they moved there and um, worshiped there in the, um, in the community center for about seven years before the uh, church moved from uh, the community center to Mark and Bob Gray. And that's when, actually let me back up, my uh, husband's family started in the early 50s in the community center. And they later moved to Happy Hill when the Greek church was built there at the corner of Mark and Bob Gray. But they were only there a few years and from 59 to 67 to 1967, the uh, 52 highway came through and they had to relocate. Um, from my understanding, the members were very upset, but that's at the time when I started going to St. Phillips. We would walk up Bar Gray to the corner of Mark Street to St. Phillips. Um, in 1967, George Hall and the congregation moved to Bonnie, our present location. Um, Reverend uh, Hall was wanting to retire, so the PEC rec recruited um, Cedric Rodney, Dr. Rodney, and Reverend Rodney came down in 67, but he, he wasn't installed until 68. So we've been at this church from 1967 until now. Reverend um, Cedric, Hall, Cedric Rodney served a period of about 40 years. He left for about four years and came back, and he served until 2003. Um, that's about the history of this church. And we don't have a graveyard at present. I have to back up a little. Um, the members of St. Phyllis was never a part of Salem Congregation until a few years ago. So now that we are a part of Salem Congregation, we can be buried at God's Acre. But between that time, members went out and purchased plots at other places, so the members are just scattered all around. But most of them are buried at Evergreen, which is now full. Any questions? I sort of skipped the pictures we had of the various churches, the Lock Church, and then the Brick Church, and then Happy Hill and Clonier, sort of show you where they are. I'm going to briefly cover the graveyards. I'm going to base it on what the National Historic Landmark designated. There's five stars, there's actually six graveyards. There's one is two graveyards in one location. So the ones we, um, Happy Hill Cemetery, it's up near where they moved to, but it was an earlier cemetery before they moved out there. You know, I think about five churches, four Baptists, and one church. Um, so it's an earlier graveyard, and as far as we know, there's no connection, but there may have been some burials that people related there, and that's one of the questions we to try and resolve you know, during the time periods. Um, everybody should be familiar with God's Acre, the main graveyard, main graveyard here. Um, and if you're not aware, we have all of our burials online available for searching. 
on the, our website, sandcongregation.org. So if you're ever looking to find burials there, and they're located by Rome Grave, and that's one thing we'd have to now expand, include the second cemetery as part of that, even though we don't have all the locations, but we'll try to identify the, the burials we do know that happened in that location at the main God's Acre. Um, and the one thing about our website is if you don't know all the specifics, you can put in like your last name and right. pull up everybody with that name. You can even put in a first name only and it'll pull up everybody with that name. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's flexible search. Um, God's Acre obviously was started 1857 after the town, the theocracy stopped and became a municipality. Uh, they established a private graveyard, which is now Salem Cemetery, which obviously still exists, um, but much different burial practices, um, allowing monuments and, and, and vertical um, and on the landscape. Um, also design more curvilinear pathways and that, um, much more typical for that time period. So that got established in between that and then what became the second graveyard, that top corner there, which was the second St. Philip's graveyard. The first St. Philip's graveyard, which is down here, actually had two parts. There's, as they mentioned, there was a stranger's graveyard, which is for any non-raving who died in the community, typically people traveling or were being treated by the doctor, would be buried in this graveyard because they weren't raving, they were strangers. Um, 1816, that shifted, because Moravian, African Americans, late three, were buried in God's Acre until that point. 1816, it flipped. Strangers, white, would be buried in God's Acre at that point, and then any African Americans, whether they're Moravian or not, were then buried in the in the what it wasn't St. Philip's at that point. They were they were buried in the African American graveyard. Now uh, the 153, the, that's all right. What was that thing? 135. Um, 108 of those were doing that 1850, 1816, 1859 period. Um, as I mentioned, that graveyard was at the front of the original 1860 church that then had an 1890 addition built up over the top of it. So some of the strangers' burials, and I think largely strangers, are underneath the church. Um, during the restoration of the church, we actually found in the hallway, this is in the hallway as you enter the church, some were stacked up underneath the joists, and others were just sort of on the ground underneath there. Where the gravestones that were supposedly taken up in 1913 when the front was cleaned up, and all the gravestones were taken and, and stored, Additional ones were actually underneath the steps themselves in front of the church. So there was 33 gravestones recovered from that. Um, seven could be supposedly assigned in specific grave locations. The others we could not identify um, which graves those particular stones went to. So the rest were put in storage or an exhibit in the law church. So those gravestones from the graveyard you know, that were found didn't all correlate. There was one gravestone still in C2 that still is in, in C2 but covered up and protected. But all the others would have been taken up in 1913. So there's a lot of research done by Leland Ferguson and Mo Hartley, the archaeologist. Um, this is an earlier map and the Mo continued work on it, uncovering all the grave locations by, by uh, surface investigation. Um, ground penetrating radar was tried, but I don't think it wasn't very definitive about locations. So they actually had to take off the surface and not disturb the graves, but locate a coloration you can identify the locations. And one big issue was also inside the church itself, the front of the church, um, those cards in the building that had large cracks and, and sinking, so they had to be identified so structural supports could be put in to support the, the brick church that was over the graveyard going forward. So in 1859, that graveyard was supposedly running out of room. Here's what was more room, but they weren't keeping great records at that point of where the burials were. So they established a new graveyard, which was on the other side of Salem Cemetery from God's Acre. You can see at the top where the circle is, they had a square area that they assigned to be used for the second cemetery. So that was the second St. Phil's graveyard at that point, 1859, just before the war um, and before the church was built. So when the church was built, they had already moved the burials. Um, this was used in the 1960s, at least. We got through some gravestones dating 1960s. So that second cemetery out there. What happened to it though, and you'll see this, Park Avenue was built, which is now at Salem Avenue. You don't see it on that map. That's a pretty, it's an earlier map. But when Park Avenue was built, it cut through that, that square portion. They weren't using it all. and didn't seem to affect the graves, and at least the investigation so far 
that was a concern we had that it, you know, that it impinged on burials and didn't seem to. So what we did, Christine told him, sorry, I was sick, couldn't make it. Um, I mean, she'll cover this because she's been working more on the research side of it to try to identify the burials. But we did have a historic map that shows some initial burials in the graveyards with names, and the inventory continues on another sheet. So based on these, we know George is the number one and goes on down the list. Um, so to confirm that, at this point, there's only about 50 gravestones still visible on the ground. All the rest of them moved or lost. So we brought in ground penetrating radar to go through the graveyard and locate the graves. What they find is basically they see where those changes in soils. So these are three different graves are side by side that they can plot and identify where there's been an excavation down into the ground and how deep they are even. Um, and they had a good success of about 331 graves that did not have gravestone currently on them. So that's where we're at now. 331 is a number of checks. So, so it's totaled that 331 plus the 50 that are visible? Okay. Yeah, that's, so that's the number that are not marked currently that need to be identified. So uh, uh, how, how we're going through this. I was going to say, uh, of those, that total, mm -hmm. how many did we have a record for in the burial here? Is about 170 or something? Well, there's a couple <coughs> lists which have been developed, and that's what we're trying to sort through right now. Is some lists, we're not sure what the sources are. In other words, some, there's names that have been, that people will say on this work on a time, we're trying to work on it. There's going to be some lists that popped up that had more names, a couple hundred names. Right. So we're trying to figure out for sure where those came from and why they're being attributed to there, because obviously there's no gravestone to confirm a name or a location. Um, so what we have, one thing we're doing is taking, this is the survey from the ground penetrating radar, and they marked all these grave locations. Um, there's magnetic pins in every single grave that they located, which is both map, this is, you know, reference, and we have a survey that ties to so we can look in directly, but we have the magnetic pins so they're easier to metal detector find a particular grave location. So one thing we're doing is taking the map, there we go, and taking the historic map and then seeing how they correlate. Yeah. Because there are some gravestones and names we know that we can sort of tie them together and know that they, we're doing some filling of some of these crosswalks that were initially planted. Uh, one good thing too, it also found to say that you know the graves didn't seem to extend beyond that cut line that they put the road through later on. So it doesn't seem like the tree line we're worried might have pinched on the graveyard, but everything seems to have a fairly clear margin of where the trees are now and where the graves we've located are. So there's other information. So there's going to be several <coughs> lists and we're trying to go through those. This is Christine's been working on. Obviously things like obituaries. I thought this one, Charles Gibson in 1874, what is that group? It's called the cemetery. He actually was a slave of Colonel Forsyth. He put them when he died active community that he's buried in the cemetery. Um, but there's lists and different sources of lists and that's what I'm trying to work through and trying to find if the church has other records or you know, we trace some obituaries and papers that identify the burials in the graveyard. But it doesn't seem to be all St. Philip's burials. There may be family members or other people in the community that are also being allowed to be buried in the graveyard. And that's one of the issues we're trying to work out is who we can't identify or not. Um, <coughs> So that's what we've sort of done research-wise. Peggy Carter's going to talk about Krause. Peggy Krause. Krause. Peggy Krause. Peggy Krause. We got several Peggy's in the committee. <laughs> Much has been done working towards uh, rectifying the unintended neglect of the maintenance given to this portion of the African American graveyard. In the past, people referred to it by different names. When St. Philip's Moravian Church became part of Salem Congregation, Salem Congregation officially named the graveyard St. Philip's Moravian Graveyard, Section 2. In, two in June 2016, Wake Forest Innovation Quarter donated the point three three seven acre parcel of land at the corner of Cemetery Street and Salem Avenue. We are thankful to them for this donation and that owning this property provides us more opportunities to enhance the functionality of the graveyard. That's the one you should be seeing. So that's the corner. 
Salem Congregation and its Graveyard Committee acknowledge that concentrated effort to restore St. Philip's Graveyard Section 2 was needed and regrettably long past due. Although general ground maintenance was being done, the Graveyard Committee held volunteer work days and cleared small trees, vines, and brush within the graveyard portion of the property. The total parcel of the land has now been surveyed. Knowing the exact boundaries of that property allows us to make improvement decisions. Decisions such as where to place fencing, parking areas, sidewalks, archways, and so forth. Ground penetrating radar, you've already heard quite a bit about it. And as David said, a nail was placed in the ground at each of the 131 unmarked graves. This will keep the graves from being lost again until we are able to place markers on them. Large power lines are, lo are situated along the hillside. The brush, trees, and vines grew unattended, and brush and trash accumulated on the hillside. Duke Energy is now maintaining the right-of-way under the power lines, and the city's sanitation department removed brush that was placed by the roadside. Gravel has been laid in the walkway to the entrance. Not only does this ease walking into the graveyard, but it also makes it easier for maintenance equipment to get access to the property. We've had calls from people doing family genealogy, asking about relatives buried in the graveyard. A sign has been placed near the walkway to identify it for individuals seeking to visit the graveyard. Much work is still needed and is in the planning, planning process. In addition to encompassing the graveyard, there is a three-foot drop-off wall, so a fence is needed, especially for safety reasons. For any of you that have visited the graveyard, you know that safe parking is not available. Down at the corner is part of the property, we have the option to develop a safe parking area. Although a sidewalk from the road has been graveled to the entranceway, Accessible walkway will still be needed from the parking area to the entrance. The graves have been located and work is being done to identify those in turn. Two methods for marking the graves are planned. The first marking will be placing a generic slab on each grave. The marker will have beloved or some other appropriate expression. As research proceeds and the identity of the interred person is determined, a marker similar to the ones in the graveyard in front of St. Philip's Moravian Church here in Salem will be placed on top of the already placed slab. Although we have had work days and seasonal mowing, there are still a lot of small brushes and trees that need to be cleared even before a fence can be installed. The ground itself is a hazard in some spots, uneven ground, exposed tree roots, and so forth. The grass is also sparse in some areas, so leveling and reseeding is needed. We all know that an archway is a requirement for Moravian graveyards, right? <laughs> so an entrance gateway with an arch is part of our plans. The current sign will then be used to identify the parking area. How can you help? You've heard a lot today. Our plans can be accomplished, but at a cost, an estimated cost of $220,000. An account to accumulate donations has been established. One may donate by sending a check to Salem Congregation on Main Street here in the city. Or you can go online to Home Moravian Church's webpage and do it online. But please note in the memo line that it's for St. Philip's Moravian Graveyard. This concludes our formal presentation this morning.
Well, thank you for coming. We hope it's been informative for you.